Welcome to Introduction to Ultrasound. My name is Juliana de Porto. Um, I'm one of the emergency medicine physicians here at UF, and I also coordinate all the ultrasound courses for the College of Medicine. Welcome to the University of Florida. Congratulations on being here. It's going to be a great experience. So let's let's just start by talking about this gentleman, René Lenec, uh, is a French doctor, and he invented this device around 1816. And initially, people thought he was crazy, that uh, it wasn't really useful. But he uh, basically invented the stethoscope. And basically, with a few modifications, we still use basically the same sort of device on a daily basis for over almost 200 years. But we're talking about ultrasound. And point-of-care ultrasound and medical, medical education has a lot of momentum going on. Uh, this is a recent uh, journal. Uh, New England Journal of Medicine, where the title is Point of Care Ultrasound, Stop Listening and Look. A lot of good things happening with ultrasound and medical education. And if we want to talk a little bit about the story of ultrasound, we need to talk about Titanic. And uh, obviously, well, you guys know that she sank in 1912. Um, and they were trying to come up with a device so they could actually look for icebergs. So the term geolocation or sonar uh, sound navigation and ranging uh, was developed in order to look for icebergs. But the military thought, well, you know, if you can look for uh, objects in the water, maybe we can look for submarines. So initially, a lot of the research in ultrasound um, was uh, done by the military. And this is from the archives of the uh, American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine. This is probably the first ultrasound in 1947. Uh, Dr. Ludwig's at the naval base. I was doing uh, basically secret research on, on presence of foreign bodies and tissues, probably looking for bullets. And also he did some uh, research on gallstones. So interesting. And as you can see, you know, machines over the years have, uh, have, have transformed from these uh, like uh, items that you would find like at a, a shop, at a mechanic shop or, or a lab. And obviously they've, they've um, continued with the, uh, advances in the technology. So the initial images that were captured by ultrasound looked kind of like that. It, it, it had an amplitude. You would find objects and you would plot a distance to those objects. But in, you know, in the 60s, um, there was a lot of, of uh, publicity about ultrasound and the uses of ultrasound in, in, medic, in medicine. This is a story from Life magazine in the 60s um, about, you know, how they would look for babies. And as you can see, that that, uh, that lady has what appears to be like a bag full of water. And those initial probes were, you know, again, coming from the sonar submarine technology. They kind of look like that. And you can see that uh, grayish uh, uh, appearance of uh, what is actually, you know, a baby's head. This gentleman here also is getting uh, some sort of abdominal ultrasound. He's sitting there in a tub full of water with a big machine, electricity. I don't know if he was very happy to be doing that. He certainly doesn't look very happy. This is the 1960s. But nowadays we've come to um, advances in technology and we have ultrasounds that you know fit in the palm of your hand. Some of them um, are, are they're, they're doing research on how they can actually hook up your, your, your phone. And uh, ones that I saw recently was uh, this kind of a finger ultrasound. Again, you put it over your finger and you can scan, again, uh, military research because of their, the thought is that you can like put your hands under like a soldier's um, armor and then you can scan. But you can obviously acquire, you know, pictures uh, literally at the tip of your thumb. So we've gone from uh, anatomy, the traditional way, you know, 17th century where they probably had to like uh, gather in dark dungeons and, and steal cadavers so they can study anatomy and, uh, you know, to uh, advances and to technology when we use the ultrasound as a tool also to learn anatomy. It's obviously uh, pretty awesome to do a dissection and that nothing takes away from doing dissections, but obviously uh, the ultrasound is an irreplaceable tool now. And if you're here at UF, you probably have driven or probably will drive by the bat house. And uh, why am I talking about bats? Well, because uh, um, bats use also uh, high frequency waves to travel. And uh, 
dolphins kind of have the same sort of a geolocation. Um, Pierre Curie uh, had a lot to do with the uh, ultrasound because he, he developed uh, or he actually discovered that some crystals reacted with an electric potential when mechanical stress was introduced. So that's got a lot of a lot of the the, the way our crystals in the transducers work. So this is one of our trauma bays, as you can see. Uh, we have a portable ultrasound sitting right there. We have now a new, newer generation ultrasounds. Um, and if we talk about ultrasound here at UIF, it started uh, in 2013. We had a, uh, a quick uh, lab for the students. Everybody loved it. And uh, we did a little pilot study, gathered some information. And, um, you know, initially a lot of people had no uh, use of ultrasounds. Um, but a lot of people um, definitely understood and that it would help them supplement their uh, understanding of anatomy, of uh, physiology. And uh, everybody thought that it would be really beneficial to continue to use ultrasound. Okay. Well, some of you might think, well, I still, I don't, I don't need it. You know, I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a dermatologist. I'm going to be a pathologist. So I don't really need uh, ultrasound. But, you know, when you're doing physio and you uh, stumble across this uh, very simple uh, graph and, you know, you have pressure and uh, you have, uh, you know, volume waves and aortic valves opening and closing and uh, systole diastole, you know, isovolumetric contractions, sounds, you know, it's a very simple graph, right? So we're going to try to help you understand uh, those concepts with the use of ultrasound uh, a little bit better. You can uh, look at the heart uh, and the flow of the heart. So our idea here is to continue to introduce you to ultrasound through the fourth years of medical school. And uh, some folks at uh, Loma Linda, California, they've been trying to come up with uh, the milestones that, uh, that they think everybody medi every, every medical student should uh, learn and that's some research that's uh, probably about to be published. Fortunately, we need to talk a little bit about physics in ultrasound, ultrasound waves are mechanical waves. They carry energy and they have an amplitude and, uh, and a period and they, it's a pressure wave. And uh, this is a movie from the 70s. Uh, uh, and that was their their slogan in space. No one can hear you scream because uh, since it's a mechanical wave, it needs a, a medium to, to propagate. And the, the way sound waves move, it's called a medium disturbance. Again, you know, they have a wavelength, they have a higher frequency, lower frequency. But basically, we can say that in dry air, the speed of sound is about 343 meters per second, but it travels four times uh, faster in water. And that's because if you think about it, water is packed a little bit tighter than air. And because of the medium disturbance, it helps propagate that, uh, that wave faster. We look at a, you know, kind of a cool picture of it. That's an NF-18 probably uh, at hypersonic speeds. And that's condensation of, of the sound waves. And if you think about it, supersonic, obviously faster than sound, what happens is that uh, that uh, plane is going to be moving ahead of the waves. And basically, that sonic boom that people describe is just a, a summation of those sound waves. And uh, when you hear the boom, it's not because they broke the barrier. It's just because that the edge of the, of the cone has reached your ear. So you're listening to all the summations of the waves. And we measure the waves in hertz and audible sound, you know, it's from uh, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Ultrasound waves are obviously not heard by the human ear unless you have, you know, some sort of bat, you know, unless you're batman. Uh, so anything greater than 20,000 hertz are, are ultrasound waves. And clinical ultrasound, basically, it's 2 to 20 megahertz, okay? And um, the way they work is, and the way we use ultrasound, it's, it's based on the pulse echo principle. Basically, you have a transducer that sends a signal and, and the waves move through the tissues and they hit objects and they we, we capture or we listen to that reflected wave. And that echo, we plot and we basically plot the intensity of the reflection and the depth of the reflection. But when we start looking at these like, you know, blurry gray images, we need to talk a little bit about terminology, okay? So we're the the term uh, echo. You're gonna hear it uh, often. Uh, we talk about objects being hyperechoic or hypoechoic, 
or anechoic and a lot of things in medicine have those prefixes right so hypo meaning like low hyper meaning high you know hypertension uh, anechoic uh, meaning uh, having no echo so that's why it looks like dark and uh, tissues in the in the body have different you know amplitudes uh, when we talk about the echoes and like bones uh, calcifications are going to be uh, how are going to have the highest amplitude like the diaphragm versus the lowest amplitude as you go down the uh, the tissues and you know, we talk about blood urine etc so but when we're scanning the, we have artifacts or things that in a way interfere with our image but uh, we also use those artifacts to uh, identify normal versus abnormal pathology and a common uh, artifact that we find is uh, shadowing and obviously if you look at that picture that old sound image you see that that skull bladder i'll tell you that uh, and you have kind of what looks like a stone it's really hyper echoic right and and below the stone uh, there's a shadow and it's because the beam that's coming from above uh, hits that highly reflective uh, s uh, structure has a uh, and the energy from the beam, in a way, is returned, uh, but it, it has le little left to continue, so you create a shadow there. Um, then you can have what's called edge shadows, and that's due because of a change in direction of the sound beam, uh, and when it, it, it encounters a, a curved structure. Uh, so you, you those are normal, okay? And then you have a thing that it's uh, called acoustic enhancement, basically, the, again, the beam is coming from above. It hits a structure that's basically empty, has you know less attenuation, and and the beam continues. And in a way, it has, if you want to think about it, it has a little bit more energy. So when it hits the posterior uh, aspect of that structure, it uh, it has basically more energy, and it, uh, it creates that um, enhanced image. And there on the right, you have the the on the right you have the the gas pattern and it's gas creates an artifact so it blocks tissues uh, and uh, another one that we commonly see they're called reverberation artifacts and it's basically when you have a beam that's passing through two structures that are highly reflective like this is in case of the bladder and you st or the pleura there and you start to create uh, lines that are basically equidistant from the from the first line and another common and very important artifact to uh, identify, it's called mirroring artifact. And there you have uh, the liver and the kidney. And on the left side, you have that hyperechoic line, and that's a diaphragm. And you're going to see that it looks like on both sides of the diaphragm, you have what looks like liver. And obviously, you don't have liver on your chest. But this is just an artifact uh, when the beam... Uh, um, hits a, an area that has a strong reflector uh, a lot of the kind of the, the the waves bounce back you have multiple reflections along the diaphragm and you basically gain an incorrect interpretation of the signal and a duplication of the structure but that tells us that that's a normal um, image one thing that we need to keep in mind and this picture is a courtesy of my father who's a retired architect is the when we're uh, using our ultrasound that beam is really thin uh, it's several, you know, a couple of millimeters thin. So when we're scanning a, uh, let's say, a, a vessel, we need to be right in the middle or, or we're going to get a, an error. It's called cylinder tangent error. And basically, we're, we're, if we're not in the middle, our probe is right over there. If we're uh, imaging on, on the side, you get, you know, that radius. But uh, if you measure uh, smack down the middle, you, you, you're going to get a different value. And that might not seem very important to you now but if we're looking at an aorta and we're trying to see if your patient has a an abdominal aneurysm and it's a blood vessel so that's going to rupture and you're going to die we really want to make sure we're measuring uh, where we were where we should be measuring we get all these patients all the time i think i need antibiotics for my cold but it's a virus um settings and planes uh, you'll see that the transducers um, they have an indicator and that's to correlate with uh, the orientation of the screen and we'll talk about those things later and as you get the hands-on you'll slowly get the, get the feel for that but we basically scan in anatomical planes you know sagittal transverse or coronal the same planes that you would um, talk about in anatomy and then for example sagittal plane where we're looking 
uh, and the right upper quadrant you're gonna see uh, the liver and the kidney uh, the indicators pointing towards the head so that means that in and on my screen the head is gonna be on the left side the feet are gonna be on the right side it's gonna be anterior and then posterior if I switch my probe and I scan transverse my indicator is towards the patient's right and I'm gonna get a picture that's uh, very much like a CT scan so you have transverse uh, uh, cross sections and, and basically you're going to be the right of the patient it's kind of like looking from the feet up so you're going to have the right side the left side anterior posterior and um, when we do coronal and this is one that confuses a lot of people the indicator is pointing towards the head but you're touching every every time you use your probe the superior portion of your screen is going to be uh, uh, where your probe is touching. So in this case, you're gonna you're gonna go from lateral to medial, and the head is you know indicators pointed upwards, so that's the head and the feet. If you wanna like try to think about that image and your patient, it's like you're scanning on the right of a quadrant. That's that's obviously a giant gigantic probe, um, but you're you're looking at that picture. So it's kind of like looking from the from uh, be from the back. So you have uh, you know lateral to medial and you know head, the head and the feet and basically on the lateral side you have the paracolic gutter um, and you'll talk about that structure in anatomy okay so the functionality of controls of an instrument as relevant to their application is called nebology and if you're going to learn one one button please at least get the idea that uh, this is where you turn the machine on and then we can control, you know, the depth of the, of our field. We can control uh, different modes. We can use different probes depending on what we're going to scan. Each each probe, each transducer has a footprint, and it's that gray area. Those are kind of the crystals. That's where the magic occurs. They have different frequencies. They have different footprints. Um, that one's a um, the one for the heart. This is a curvilinear. We use it for abdominal uh, exams. And this is again a comparison of the phase array, the small one, and the high frequency linear probe that we used for um, for blood vessels and, and 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 musculoskeletal. You have to handle them with care because they're really expensive. They're about ten to fifteen thousand dollars each. And uh, if we talk about modes in ultrasound, we mainly use uh, B, um, M, and, and Doppler mode. A mode is that old one that I showed you from the 40s or amplitude, but B mode mainly uh, signifies brightness, and that's what the image that you're normally looking at. M stands for motion, and you can just basically um, record motion in any plane that you tell the machine. If we look at the mitral valve, for example, there, we, we can see the motion of the mitral valve as it opens during uh, diastole and closes. We have Doppler mode, those are blood vessels, and that's blood flow. No, red doesn't mean arterial, blue is not venous. That would be really cool. That's just direction of flow. We'll talk about it uh, later. And then we can also see that's a bladder, and that those are red lines. That's Those are called urethral jets, and that is basically urine coming into your bladder from your kidneys. You can, uh, again, move, move the depth of your image. That's... Uh, that's you know and, and depending on what you're looking at you can increase or decrease the depth and that's obviously very deep and that's a lot of information that we don't need and that's that looks that looks much better that's adequate um and for those those of us who remember uh, uh black and white tv uh there's another thing called the gain and basically the gain uh takes that the changes the overall strength of the echoes it can, it's kind of an amplifier, so it makes it either dark or bright. And you have near field gain and far field gain. Uh, and as you play around, and we will show you um, uh, during the labs, you'll get to use all these things. But basically, um, we use the ultrasound in the emergency department, and we scan from eyeball to ankle. Uh, and uh, it's really useful. It uh, decreases time to diagnosis. Uh, it gives us our answers and makes helps us in our clinical uh, uh, judgment and applications so uh, that's all for now and we'll see you in the lab